Okay, so when you're on the mm -hmm. um, interior of the school, sorry about that. It's okay. So the center portion um, includes a decorative cornice and a concrete panel that reads Walter M. Williams High School. At the intersection of the main block and the east and west wings are three-story rounded bays with glass block that extends nearly the full height of the elevation, lighting stairwells on the interior, which retains its original plan with terrazzo floors, plaster walls, metal lockers inset into the walls, and solid wood doors with textured or frosted lights. Next. The front hall and the administrative wing retain marble wainscot, and the circular stairs retain original railings. Some windows on the building have been replaced with smaller windows and opaque panels to accommodate interior dropped ceilings, but the overall effect of the historic exterior is still intact. Next. In 1951 auditorium wing, the first part of the building to be fully completed is a massive two-story art modern style wing at the Northeast corner of the school. The interior of the auditorium is currently being renovated and has had the seating removed, but retains sloped concrete floors, plaster walls and ceilings, metal railings, curtains at the stage and framing the balcony. And the lobby retains terrazzo floors and large round columns with lit capitals that support the balcony above. Next. The gymnasium wing completed in 1955 is located at the northwest corner of the building and retains original metal trusses, brick walls, and a balcony at the south end. The lobby in that wing also retains terrazzo flooring, marble wainscot, and square columns. Next. Bulldog Alley separates the school building from the athletic facilities, which include the 1947 to 1959 Burlington City Schools Memorial Stadium. So the stadium was actually completed before the school building as well as a memorial field house, football field, and baseball field. A circa 2000 one-story brick veneered classroom building, and that's the image on the bottom, stands north of the school and east of the stadium and is the only building or portion of the campus that would be considered non-contributing to that nomination because of its age. Next. The school served yeah. an important- uh, Heather, are you seeing the screen clearly? Yes. Okay. There you go. The school served an important role in school integration and the broader civil rights movement in Burlington. It was constructed to educate white students while Jordan Sellers High School in Northeast Burlington served the black students. As late as 1968, the district had failed to make significant progress towards school integration. While the school board began construction of Hugh M. Cummings High School, an integrated school which would replace Sellers High School by 1970, racial tensions within Walter Williams came to a head in May of 1969. When no African-American students were selected for the cheerleading squad, the student body staged a sit-in at the school on May 16th, which was followed by a march to the school administrative offices on Fisher, where vandalism resulted in 15, at least 15 students being arrested, and ultimately a violent riot erupted in downtown Burlington. Ultimately, ultimately one student was allowed onto the cheerleading um, the cheerleading squad and a human relations council was formed at the school, gradually reducing uh, racial tensions and the school system was fully integrated by 1971. The period surrounding integration is also documented in the book Black Coach, which tells the story of head coach Jerome Evans, who served the school from 1970 to 1976. Next. So the National Register um, recommendation is for the full 23 and a half acre parcel historically associated with the school and includes all of the buildings and athletic fields. The period of significance for the school extends from 1947, beginning with the construction of the stadium and field house and extends through 1971 when the school district was fully integrated. The 1984 West Davis Street Fountain Place National Register Historic District, which you see outlined in the solid blue, encompasses the highest concentration of surviving late 19th and early 20th century houses built for the city's growing middle class. That boundary did not, however, include numerous modest early 20th century buildings, nor residential development from the 1930s through the 1960s that stands directly adjacent to the, built, to the district. In 1992, five areas adjacent to the historic district were placed on the North Carolina study list. 
This recommendation serves to amend that 1992 recommendation and includes areas that fully reflect the middle and upper class development of West Burlington. It also includes a small boundary decrease to remove incompatible development. Next. We'll sort of walk you through the, the boundary areas. Boundary increase area A, which is north of the district, includes 14 early to mid 20th century vernacular houses, craftsman houses, and small scale ranches. Boundary increase area C to its south includes 11 craftsman style houses, largely dating from the 1930s. Next. Boundary increase area B, which is the largest of the areas, illustrates the continued development of West Burlington and the West Davis Street Fountain Place National Register District from the 1930s through the 1960s. It includes approximately 79 properties, Houses in the core of this area are large scale, generally colonial revival style houses on large, well, well landscaped lots. And these houses, constructed by leaders in the community and the textile industry, illustrate the continued appeal of West Burlington throughout the mid 20th century as a residential area for, build, for Burlington's upper class. Lots at the periphery are smaller in scale and contain craftsman style houses, period cottages, and ranch houses but their age and overall okay. character is consistent with the adjacent housing in the rest of the district. Boundary increase area D includes approximately 70 intact early 20th century houses along 5th Street and Hillcrest, as well as mid 20th century colonial revival and craftsman style houses along Fountain Place, Kime and East Willowbrook Avenue. It also includes the 1931 Hillcrest Elementary School the three-story brick school building was placed on the North Carolina study list as an individually eligible property in 1992. Next. Finally, we're recommending a small boundary decrease for the multifamily housing complexes at the Northeast corner of West Front and Peel Streets. These buildings, which are dated in the tax records to 1975, are labeled as intrusive in the 1984 nomination. They are not oriented to face the street and are not in keeping with the character of the single family houses on West Front Street. Next. So in summary, the West Davis Street Fountain Place Historic District boundary increase that we're proposing is significant for its community planning and development context and for its architecture. It includes a significant collection of early to mid 20th century residential resources, illustrating the substantial growth of Burlington and its textile industry during this period. The period of significance for the boundary increase areas, which are a little bit younger than the core of the existing historic district, would extend from about 1920 to about 1960 to encompass the, the general ages of those buildings. Next. And finally, we have one more recommendation, and that is for a Central Heights National Register Historic District. This historic district appears eligible also for its community planning and development and for its architecture. Located at the west end of the study area, uh, the neighborhood was platted in 1925 and includes curvilinear streets, planned green space along a natural ravine, and land reserved for a temporary golf course. The neighborhood is one of several middle-class developments in Burlington that were platted in the 1920s, including Fountain Place, Brookwood and Country Club Estates in West Burlington and Beverly Hills in North Burlington. Of those, Central Heights is most consistent with the Beverly Hills neighborhood, which was listed on the National Register in 2009. It features curvilinear streets and houses in the colonial revival craftsmen and period revival styles of the 1930s. Next slide as well as minimal traditional ranch and other houses from the 1940s and 50s. The center streets along Circle Drive are at the highest elevation were developed first with colonial revival craftsman and Tudor style houses and low stone walls along Circle Drive and deep lawns along Parkview Drive slope downward toward the Arboretum and are a response to the natural topography of the area. Construction after World War II continued to the north and west spurred in part by the construction of Walter Williams High School and the subdivision of the north part of the former golf course into additional lots for the neighborhood. 
The street patterns and landscaping are characteristic of the early to mid 20th century development and the period of significance um, would expand from 1925 when the neighborhood was platted to about 1960 when the last homes were constructed. And the other thing to note on this slide is that the original plat for Central Heights was much larger than what we're proposing for a historic district. And it included those areas that are outlined in dotted lines. However, the properties along South Church Street are largely commercial in nature. Um, and so they also divide the core of the neighborhood from the properties south of Church Street. The properties along the Northeast side, um, several of those were proposing for inclusion into the West Davis Street Fountain Place Historic District because they're uh, contig contiguous to that district. Um, and so the boundary makes more sense for them to stay over there. And that is all I have, unless you all have questions about the, the project and the recommendations. Um, and I will say that these, so <clears throat> then in North Carolina, they have what's called a study list phase for the National Register. And that is something that the, the state of North Carolina, the staff and the National Register Advisory Committee, which is a group of volunteers who review National Register applications for the state, um, have determined that these appear to be eligible for the National Register. So it is not a National Register listing, it is a preliminary determination of eligibility. So you already had that preliminary determination of eligibility for portions of the West Davis Street Fountain Place area that were proposed in 1992. Um, and those were still sitting on the study list. So one of the things that we did was to reevaluate and um, sort of amend those proposed boundaries. But these are these change neither the National Register listings nor anything to do with the local districts, um, unless you go ahead and pursue a National Register nomination for full designation of these properties. Okay, Heather, thank you um, so much. I do see a sure. um, question in the chat from Debbie Gilmore. Is Hillcrest School the only building on Hillcrest that qualifies? No, the Hillcrest School was placed on the study list individually in 1992. So at that point, that building on its own, like Walter Williams today, was determined eligible as a, an individual property on the National Register. Because of the replacement windows, it may or may not still be individually eligible, but we decided to include it within the proposed historic district boundary increase in that area. So everything within those dotted lines um, and Jamie can maybe skip back to that map. Yes, I will go back to mm -hmm. that map. There you go. So everything within that dotted line is what we have proposed and what they have um, agreed is preliminarily eligible. Um, now with any historic district designation, when they actually, if and when you move forward with a National Register nomination, those boundaries would be reevaluated as part of that on the ground survey to write that nomination. So they're always a little bit fluid until a full nomination is prepared, but this is what has been determined eligible. All right, uh, next question on the chat from Richard Knapp. Will the adding of Williams to the historic registry um, affect the ability to maintain and remodel for efficiency? No, the National Register doesn't have any regulatory component with it, unless um, the property is receiving state or federal funding or permits. So as long as there are no federal funds being used to update the building, there's no impact on what can be done to the building. Um, and I will say that even for projects that have state and federal funding, it requires an, what they call environmental review, which is a little bit misleading, but um, a review to see how it impacts historic and archeological resources. So it would have a review done of the project to try to mitigate um, impacts to the historic resources, but it wouldn't stop any projects from happening, um, if that makes sense. A next question, Michelle K. The bungalows on West Front, 800 block, south, mm -hmm. uh, south side, not included. Are they not old enough? 
they are old enough and I'm trying to think because I went back and looked at them later because we surveyed all of those. We found that we couldn't because of incompatible things along Atwater, we couldn't get to them from the West, but I'm actually wondering, looking back at the map now, if we could get to them from Trollinger Street. So that is an area that I think I would put a note in the file to have them consider in, a, in an actual nomination um, because there are some great properties there. And I don't honestly remember why we didn't pull them out at that for this project, why we did pull them out. Okay, um, next question from Chuck Whirl. As a homeowner, what's the benefit of being part of a historic district? Because it sounds like a lot of hurdles from my neighbors who currently live in the historic district. Why would we want this? So I think the hurdles that you're, I don't know where you live, but I assume that the hurdles that your neighbors are going through are the local historic district designation. Um, so the, the local historic district is the one that has the zoning and the regulatory component. Um, in ACOC right now, there is no national register district. However, the, the national register, which is what this recommendation is for, has no regulatory component. So the only time that you would have any regulation on your property is if you are using state or federal funding or permits, um, which is, almost never the case for private property owners. Um, so the, a lot of it is just the confusion between a local historic district and a national historic district. And your um, West Davis Street Fountain Place is both of those, although the boundaries are not exactly the same for both of those districts. So that's where, that's where I think the confusion is happening. The majority of property owners in national register historic districts um, may not even know that they are in a historic district. The main benefit to historic districts, and I know that Molly just asked this, is that you are eligible for state income tax credits. Now, this qualifies as state funding. So if you pursue state income tax credits, then you have to jump through the hurdle of having your work approved by the State Historic Preservation Office but you are under no um, requirement to utilize the state tax credits or to have that review. Okay, so the next I see, you've, I think you've responded to Molly's comment. Um, Richard, would the, local historic, would the local historic admin look to follow street, look to follow suit with national? Um, so I think, that's probably more of a, in terms of a follow through with this um, recommendation, I'm assuming he's talking about. Yeah, I th I, I, I'm not sure if he means, are you looking to follow through with the national register expansion or whether the local district would also be expanded? And I can't answer really to either of those. Right. And that, you know, at this, at this point, um, this is a uh, preliminary um, report uh, on the national registry and there's no, uh, this has no impact on the um, local historic district boundaries or expansions. Um, in terms of Michelle Richard, what allows a local entity to declare a section as historically protected does this national recognition allow the door for the local organization? So I think that I think you're asking about whether or not there's any protection or whether there's local protection. And there is no protection for a national register historic district unless there's a property with state or federal funding. So there's that sort of limited protection where it has to be reviewed um, for projects and those projects the majority of those projects tend to be um, DOT projects or cell tower projects. So, you know, if they wanted to widen South Church Street into a six lane thoroughfare, this would offer some protection, some protection from that, but there's no protection of individual buildings or properties. Um, and whether or not the local district 
um, any sort of local overlay is completely independent from a National Register Historic District. So those tend to be locally driven. If there are enough folks in an area that want it, then they can petition the city, but there's no, there's no tie to the National Register. Okay, I, um, I also do see a hand raised. I'm going to get through the rest of these. Um, so if approved nationally, what would stop the local to apply their rules? Well, you would have to expand the local historic district and that would be a zoning change that right. would go through the same as any zoning change. And then uh, Michelle K, would you be excluding the gas station store at the corner of Front and Trollinger? It's on the local map as included. At Front and Trollinger. Oh, I can't see the map. I don't think so. I think the it's oh it's on the local map i don't have the local maps so i don't know what's in the local historic district and Charles, let me go to that um i can go over to that main page that has the uh, whole area while i'm yep. doing that let's we didn't review maps of the local district so i don't know where those boundaries are i think they were on that's the national register yeah. district Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have the local ones, so you'd have to pull them from somewhere okay. else. I think it's outside of the local historic district right now. Um, so I don't want to overlook the person who has their hand raised, uh, 336-264-0684. I'm going to allow you to speak. And if you want to just uh, identify yourself for the record. Kai, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. yes. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is my name is Greg and uh, I live on uh, Parkview Drive. Uh, my question is twofold. Does this have any tax implications for us if this goes through? In other words, Will our taxes be raised because of it? Uh, and number two, what what is the benefit? Because I'm not sure I understood um, before. Um, I'm not sure what the benefit is here. Not not that it wouldn't look nice uh, to say my house is in the National Historic District, but um, other than that, I'm not sure what the benefits are here. And I'm not, you know, just trying to understand. That's all. Sure. The, so the National Register was created in the 1960s to be a sort of honorary list of projects of properties that were important across our country. Um, in the 1970s, the federal government introduced rehabilitation tax credits. Um, the federal tax credits are for commercial or income producing properties, so they would only be for rental properties in this area. However, um, the state also has an income tax credit for owner occupied residences. So the main reason that people want his national historic districts these days is for those tax credits. So if you have commercial buildings, which you all don't have, there are both state and federal tax credits that can be applied to rehabbing those buildings. And those are the same tax credits that are used for the giant mill projects um, and downtown revitalization projects. Homeowner tax credits in North Carolina right now are a 15% um, income tax credit, and that is 15% of the cost of your rehab. So in North Carolina right now, if you live in a National Register Historic District and you are doing at least $10,000 worth of work, which is not a lot if you need a new HVAC system or a roof or your house painted, if you're spending at least $10,000, and the work is approved by the State Historic Preservation Office, which again, if you're just doing um, systems work and painting and sort of general upkeep, things like that, um, none of those things would trigger any sort of uh, red flags from them. If you are already doing that work and you're spending that money, you can get 15% of your costs back as a state income tax credit, which is basically just a dollar for dollar um, money toward paying your state income tax bill. So the main benefit is that there is a little bit of money, you have to spend the money initially, but that you can get some of that money back 
for maintaining and rehabbing buildings in those historic districts. The, the tax credits used to be much better before, to the, when did they cut them? In 2015, it used to be a 30% homeowner tax credit, but the legislation cut the tax credit in 2015. And when it came back, it was much smaller. So, but 15% is still free money if you are doing things that you would be needing to do anyway. Greg, before, I hope that answers your question. Before you hang up, would you mind just stating your full name? Uh, yes, it's uh, Greg Sikposian. Sikposian. And um, yes, and um, the other thing was, does this have implications where our, our taxes would be raised? No, the local, I don't know when they evaluate things in Alamance County, but the local tax department doesn't have this information and doesn't, they, they do their evaluations on their own schedule. And I'm not sure they even know where these districts are. Jamie, can you answer anything about that? Uh, that's pretty much as, as much as I know. Um, I don't think it has, will have any impact at all um, as far, you know, there's, no change in the zoning of the property, no added restrictions. Um, so I don't, even if that was the case, I don't see how that would have an impact on it. Now they have, Thank they, you. sure. Now they have done a number of surveys. I think some of the best ones were done in Greensboro in the eighties and nineties um, that documented property values over time, and I think they just updated them again in the last five years or so, where they were tracking property values for, these were for locally designated districts versus not locally designated. So it's not quite the same as your question because you're talking about national register districts. And they found that local districts held their value over time and experienced gradual increases where not undesignated districts had more fluctuation in property value. So, um, the main, I think, and I've heard from realtors as well, that property values in designated historic districts, whether local or national, tend to be um, more consistent and have fewer fluctuations. But uh, I don't know the impacts on a local tax thing. And I'm pulling up the zoning map to just check on this property for um, Michelle. Uh, while I'm doing that, are there any other questions from members of the um, audience? If you have any, feel free to um, uh, dial star nine or use the raise hand feature and I will be able to call on you. So there's, I think Michelle still had a concern about triggering local review. And then there's a question about next steps. So this project, only makes recommendations. So there's nothing that changes at all from, you know, April when we started this project to October when we finished it. All the report has is recommendations for national historic districts. Um, local historic districts are their own completely separate process of establishing and expanding. And those would go through, I don't know how it works exactly in Burlington, but they go through extensive public hearings because it's a zoning change. So this is not a zoning change. Um, the next steps is generally these study list recommendations will sit on the, on the state's study list and on their maps until individuals or the city or someone wants to move them forward. So if you think about the fact that those um, boundary increases that were proposed in 92 were still just on the maps and were never followed through. A lot of study lists, depending on the areas in which they're done, um, can sit there indefinitely. If you individual property owners or the city would want to move forward with any of these national register designations, um, essentially they would just hire a consultant to prepare a full nomination and submit those to the National Register Advisory Committee at the state who would then make recommendations to the National Park Service.
uh, my apologies, um, 538 Trollinger is within the local historic district. So I just added that to the chat, but it's right on the edge um, on the uh, corner of Front and Trollinger. Let's see, I'm trying to see if anybody else from the public has any questions. I'm not seeing anyone else's hand raised or um, So I think I think that uh, that covers it um, on the city of Burlington's web page on the uh, the Historic Preservation Commission page. Um, there is um, project information um, updates on this uh, project itself. Oh, there is a question um, who funded the study. That was from get uh, Debbie Gilmore. So this was um, funded through uh, our certified local grants um, through the state. You wanna, Heather, if you wanna go into any more detail pertaining to the breakdown of that. Um, I don't remember what the breakdown was, but the, the State Historic Preservation Office gets money from the federal government, which I remember correctly comes from proceeds from offshore drilling something. It's been that way since the 1970s. So they get an allocation of money every year. And part of that they use to pass through funds to certified local governments. So the certified local governments are governments like Burlington that have a, lo a local historic district with a historic district commission and at least some portion of a dedicated planner. A lot of them don't have full-time planners don't have a planner that is dedicated full-time to a national historic commission, not a national. Essentially, because you have a local district and you have um, historic preservation happening in Burlington, you are edge eligible for these matching funds. And I say matching, but they're not always half and half matching. So a portion of the money came from this federal pass-through grant and a portion of the money was provided by the city of Burlington. And I don't remember the purport or the the numbers offhand. Yeah, it's in. The, I think it's in the chat. Twenty. Uh, I'll double check, but I think uh, Chuck's numbers are correct on there. Twenty four thousand from the grant, and then uh, six thousand um, match. We call it, but uh, contribution from the city. Oh, so I was saying before that information pertaining to this um, project is on the city of Burlington's website. If you go to the Historic Preservation Commission page um, and look for information on the architectural survey update, you'll find um, all of the different presentations and the outreach um, that has been conducted. And then the final report will also be uploaded um, at that point too. Um, there will also be a presentation to the city council, um, and that will probably be um, in December, and we'll we'll have that as the wrap up. Well, at this point, I would just like to thank um, Heather so much for all of her hard work and dedication uh, to this. Um, project. It's a lot of information and it's a great um, tool for the city um, to use as a resource to help document our um, resources here. And um, would like to also just thank all of the people who have um, uh, joined us on the call and participated. If you have additional questions um, or you want to get additional information, you can certainly reach out um, to the planning department, you can reach out to me. Um, or you can always email me uh, at jamie or j lawson at burlington uh, nc.gov. So thanks again, and hope everybody has a good rest of your evening. Thanks, Heather. I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>